Hi, I'm Abby Dernberg, and I'm going to tell you in this segment about our characterization of special chromosome regions that play a, a critical role during meiosis to ensure proper chromosome segregation. So I'll remind you that during meiosis, the goal is to separate homologous chromosomes, the copy of, of the same chromosome inherited from the mother and the father, and that in order to do that, during meiosis, chromosomes have to pair with each other. They have to undergo synapsis, the formation of the synaponemal complex, and they have to undergo recombination, in which DNA is cut and repaired to give rise to these crossovers, which hold chromosomes together until they're, they're ready to segregate. So we have many open questions in this field. Uh, our lab and many other labs are very interested in understanding how are these processes uh, of pairing, synapsis, and recombination executed and regulated. And also, these are, these are really uh, dynamic processes that are happening on very different temporal and spatial scales. So how is it that all of these different processes um, are coordinated so that they occur in the proper order and to ensure that they, they, they occur as, as faithfully as possible? Um, so as I've told you in, in my introductory segment, we study these processes in the nematode C. elegans, and, and it's a great system because we can visualize a lot of what's happening by looking in the microscope. And this is the region of the C. elegans reproductive tract, the gonad, in which chromosomes undergo pairing. Um, and just to show you again what, what you're seeing, uh, these are nu individual nuclei. E each each uh, sphere is a nucleus stained with a DNA dye. And as nuclei enter this transition zone region where pairing and synapsis occur, they take on a, a, a different appearance. And you can kind of get the sense that chromosomes are moving around in the nucleus, which they obviously must do to go from being unpaired to paired. Um, one of the things that happens in, in all organisms, as far as we know, during meiosis is that chromosomes are reorganized in a way that we think facilitates the process of pairing. So, in a, a typical cell during interphase, the, the period of, of active uh, protein uh, expression uh, between mitoses, chromosomes are sort of uh, diffuse in the microscope, and they are kind of globular. They tend to kind of ball up into little uh, territories within the nucleus, and they're organized by many proteins. Um, one of the more important proteins that, that organizes chromosomes are the cohesin complexes. Um, and those, those play many roles. They, they, uh, their, their most famous role is to hold chromosomes together after DNA replication, but they also serve to organize chromosomes into loops. Um, so uh, when chromosomes replicate, and, and now there's two copies, the, the cohesin complexes hold them together until mitosis or meiosis. Um, and what happens during meiotic prophase is really interesting, and we don't really understand it. It, it yet, somehow these cohesin complexes get reorganized into a linear structure that we call the chromosome axis. And one thing that this probably does is it, to, is, is it causes the chromosomes to uh, adopt an elongated conformation, which probably facilitates pairing simply by uh, laying out the chromosome in a linear way, because trying to pair up uh, globular things is much harder than trying to pair up linear things. Um, so we know that this process of pairing and synapsis has multiple steps. And we know that the, the, the formation of this, this matrix, the synaponemal complex, um, is, a, is a stepwise process that begins with the formation of the axes, as I just described. So that happens uh, even before chromosomes pair. And then only after they pair uh, is the formation of this complete complex triggered. Um, and and it, we sort of draw it as if it's a zipper zippering up the chromosomes, and we have some evidence that it actually behaves that way. So how does pairing and synapsis occur? Um, when, when I started my lab, we wanted to explore this question, and we started by investigating these special regions that we knew existed on the, the, CL, the six chromosomes in C. elegans. So, these are the six chromosomes. Um, and on each chromosome, I've just uh, illustrated with a, a dark box, this region that we knew uh, was important for the process of pairing and synapsis. We knew that these regions were important from studies of chromosome rearrangements. So for example, if you have a, a, a worm that has a normal copy of chromosome 4, but then it has this chromosome, which is, uh, has a little piece of chromosome 4, but is mostly chromosome 5, um, these two chromosomes are mostly 
non-homologous, not related to each other. But because they share homology at that end that we call the pairing center region, they will undergo pairing and synapsis, and they'll, they'll undergo recombination and segregate away from each other. So we didn't really know the molecular nature of these pairing centers, but we knew that they were important for determining which, which chromosome a particular chromosome would pair with. And we also could show that in a situation like this, where the two X chromosomes have both been um, deleted for that region that contains this, this pairing center activity, the X chromosomes would fail to pair and synapse. That's what we're looking at here. So these are individual nuclei. Again, each ball is one nucleus. Um, and these nuclei are, are at the pachytene stage of meiosis. So in a wild-type animal, if we stain these nuclei with antibodies that recognize the axis in red and the, the synaponemal complex in green, what we see is six stretches um, that stain with both antibodies, um, indicating that the six chromosomes are fully paired and synapsed. Whereas in this mutant, what we see is five synapsed chromosomes and two little red squiggles which are the unpaired X chromosomes that have failed to pair and synapse. So we knew that this region was important, and we wanted to understand at a molecular level, what is it? And how does it mediate chromosome pairing and synapsis? Our first major clue came from analysis of a different kind of mutation. Um, and this was a mutation called HIM8. So I told you that HIM stands for high incidence of males. And HIM8 was a mutation identified in a screen for mutants that give lots of males. Uh, it was an unusual mutant because whereas most mutations that affect meiosis affect all the chromosomes, this mutation only seems to affect the behavior of the X chromosomes. And yet HIM8, the gene, mapped to a chromosome that was not the X chromosome. So we were very interested in understanding what it was about this HIM8 mutation that messed up segregation of the X chromosomes. When we looked cytologically at chromosomes in HIM8 mutants, what we saw was very similar to what we see in the absence of the X chromosome pairing centers. Again, the X chromosomes specifically fail to undergo pairing and synapsis. And so HIM8 seemed like a really interesting molecule to get to know a little bit more about. So what we did is we cloned the gene, which simply means we identified the, the genetic locus that was affected by the HIM8 mutation. And it turned out to encode a protein uh, that we raised an antibody against. And when we stained uh, the, the, the germline tissue with this antibody, this is what we saw. So on top is, again, a whole uh, gonad, a reproductive organ within the, the worm, stained with a DNA dye. So you see the individual nuclei. And then below is antibody staining for the HIM8 protein. And what you can see is there are little tiny dots throughout the gonad. And if I blow up this region of the gonad, the transition zone, where the chromosomes are undergoing pairing and synapsis, you get um, a little more detailed picture. What we see is in the premiotic nuclei, um, there are two spots of HIM8 in each nucleus. Um, and then in this transition zone region, we see a mixture of nuclei with one, one spot and occasionally two spots. And then all of the spots fuse to form a single spot. So this very intriguing localization pattern suggested that HIM8 might interact directly with the pairing center region of the X chromosome. And we could test that idea by uh, performing a dual labeling experiment where we labeled a HIM8 protein with an antibody shown in yellow. And we um, labeled specific regions of the genome by in situ hybridization. So here we've uh, used a probe that recognizes the left end of the X chromosome in pink and the middle of the X chromosome in green. And I hope you can see that in these meiotic nuclei, HIM8 co-localizes with the left end of the X chromosome, where we knew this pairing center activity was. So that's great. It looks like we have a bona fide uh, protein that binds to the X chromosome and is required for its pairing and synapsis during meiosis. The other thing that we learned by localizing HIM8 uh, is shown here, um, where we've also stained these nuclei for uh, the, the nuclear lamina. So we've used an antibody against the lamin protein, which forms sort of a matrix um, underlying the nuclear membranes. And that's just to mark the nuclear periphery. And what I hope you can see is that the HIM8 uh, spot in each of these nuclei is plastered right up against the edge of the nucleus. And we wondered, of course, what is this interaction, apparent interaction with the nuclear envelope about? And in my next segment, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. First, I'll just tell you that, that after identifying HIM8 as this protein that binds specifically to the X chromosome, 
we realized there must be other factors that interacted with the other chromosomes, and, and we speculated they might be similar to him 8 It turns out that, that him 8 is one of four genes in the C. elegans genome that are highly related to each other. They all have two zinc fingers, which are DNA binding domains. Um, and we were able to show that ZIM2, as we named it for zinc finger in meiosis, specifically recognizes the pairing center region on one of the autosomes, on chromosome 5. But then there are two other proteins that are shared by autosomes. So ZIM1 binds chromosomes 2 and 3, and ZIM3 binds chromosomes 1 and 4. Um, this is a sort of intriguing setup where the, there are four proteins, six chromosomes. We don't think it's just that the, the protein uh, is somehow identifying the chromosome. We actually think that these proteins probably had a common ancestor, and at one time there was probably only one protein for all of the chromosomes. Um, but we do think that maybe the diversification of this protein family has contributed some cues that are used in the process of pairing and synapsis. One thing we really wanted to know, of course, when we identified these, these pairing center proteins is what is it that targets them to individual chromosomes? And uh, to address this, we took advantage of a, an interesting feature of C. elegans biology, which is that when you inject DNA by microinjection into um, the nematode, what happens is that injected DNA gets uh, sort of ligated together to make these very high copy uh, extra chromosomal arrays, um, and they can be maintained uh, through a population. So what we did is we, we took chunks of genomic DNA from the region of the X chromosome that recruits HIM8, injected them into worms, formed these extra chromosomal arrays, and then asked whether these arrays contained anything that could recruit the HIM8 protein. And so this is an example of one such experiment where we've taken um, a, a fish probe to mark the array in red, and we've stained for the HIM8 protein in yellow. And in this case, the, the big extra chromosomal array clearly can recruit the, the, the HIM8 protein. Uh, so what we did is we sort of whittled down from very large pieces of DNA uh, down and down until we identified a much smaller fragment of only 500 base pairs that was sufficient to recruit the HIM8 protein in this assay. And this 500 base pair fragment uh, looks like this. I've color-coded the basis here just to highlight the, the very obvious repetitive uh, structure in the middle of it. Um, so we identified this motif that was re repeated within this short fragment that's sufficient to, to recruit HIM8. And, and we speculated that this motif was potentially a HIM8 binding motif. Um, that idea was definitely reinforced when we looked at the distribution of this motif in the genome. It's, it's pretty much restricted to the X chromosome, and it's highly enriched on the left end of the X chromosome where this pairing center activity is. And we were able to show that, indeed, this motif is uh, bound by HIM8, both in vitro and in vivo, and that's what targets it to the X chromosome. And we, um, we wanted to know, though, whether there's something else in this region that is important for pairing center activity, or is it simply the recruitment of HIM8 through this simple DNA motif? So to ask that question, what we did is we took these worms that I described that had these extra chromosomal arrays that could recruit the HIM8 protein, and, they, and, and we crossed them to worms that had X chromosomes that lacked their natural pairing center. And then we used a trick where we irradiate the animals with ultraviolet light, and we could find cases where um, the array was inserted back into the X chromosome that lacked its natural pairing center. And when we homozygosed those chromosomes, we could ask whether these um, artificial HIM8 recruiting uh, arrays were sufficient for pairing center function. And to our delight, we saw that um, the insertion of these uh, uh, HIM8 binding um, repetitive elements onto the X chromosome was, in fact, sufficient for pairing and synapsis. And we could score that cytologically here by showing that the, the X chromosomes are now pairing and synapsing. Um, and we can also score it genetically by showing that the very high rate of X chromosome missegregation reflected as the number of male progeny um, in the absence of the X chromosome pairing center is rescued when we inserted this array into the chromosomes. Um, and here's just one more assay where we could show that um, the X chromosomes are undergoing crossover recombination because they're not hanging out as individual univalents um, at the end of meiotic prophase. They are, they are still paired. Um, okay, so, so now we have uh, 
zinc finger protein that is recruited to the X chromosome and, and through similar kinds of assays, we were able to show that there are similar motifs on the other chromosomes that recruit these other zinc finger proteins. And so now we want to understand how it is that these pairing centers and their associated zinc finger proteins contribute to pairing and synapsis. And that's what I'll describe in the next segment. Thanks. <laughs>